Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin. So the, our next speaker is Ekaterina Necheva. She's currently an associate researcher at the University of Lille in France. She received her MA and PhD degrees from the University of St. Petersburg in Siena in Italy. Her PhD was published in 2014 by Steiner Verlag with the title Embassies, Negotiation and Gifts. She dealt with system of Eastern Roman diplomacy. Dr. Necheva has received several prestigious fellowships, including those from Barton Oaks, uh, European Institute for Advanced Studies, hosted by Collegium Atletico in Missouri, and the uh, Migration and Mobilité du Spetentico through Research Center at University of Tübingen in 2017. Her current project, Expatria, focuses on distance-driven emigration in the late antique world. Her paper today is titled From Constantinople to Pesicon uh, on the Status of the Mobile Elites. Please welcome Dr. Lechev. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you so much to our uh, masters for presentation. It's a great privilege and an enormous pleasure also to be here. Uh, and so I start uh, here uh, as much in this talk as a part of a bigger project that I'm currently working on, besides like expatria. It is a work in progress which envisages a study of emigration, and in particular, currently, I'm interested in dissident driven emigration in late antique world, but I mostly work from the perspective of the late Roman Empire. In the recent uh, volume on cosmopolitanism and empire, editors Lavan Payne and Weisweiler defined cosmopolitanism as a complex of practices and ideas that enabled persons and polities to freely cross cultural boundaries, allowing states and their ruling elites to manage cultural differences. Mobility and migration of various types were constantly taking place between Roman and Persian empires. The two, not to say capitals, centers of uh, royal presences, power, and uh, major cities, Tessiphon and Constantinople attracted and hosted members of foreign elites. The questions I want to address today regard the problem of freedom of movement that these mobile and interconnected elites would enjoy in crossing not the cultural but the political uh, boundaries uh, between the two states. And what was their status uh, uh, while abroad? How sustainable this immigration would have been? And I will focus, I will do it through two case studies, so very specific, uh, of two, uh, two uh, episodes of dissidence-driven emigration from the Roman to Persian Empire happening both in 530s, in the 30s of the 6th century. So emigration and then the forced return in both uh, the three cases, forced returns of the migrants. So the first uh, story, according to Agathias Scholasticus, seven Hellenic philosophers decided to move to Persia, to Persia, allegedly from Athens, from the Roman Empire. <coughs> the reason of this emigration, according to Agathias, was twofold. They didn't feel secure in the intolerant empire of Justinian, and they idealized the Persian state. That's what Agathias tells us. As his account goes, uh, their philosophers were soon disappointed with the Persian society and with the Shah himself, choosing to come back home and benefiting from a special diplomatically agreed safe conduct. That's, in a nutshell, uh, the story of the famous philosopher's emigration, which I'll try to deconstruct and to analyze today. Agathias Scholasticus is our only direct source uh, for the story. A poet and a lawyer, he wrote his history uh, in 570s, to cover the years uh, uh, of history of 550s. So the story of the philosopher's move to Persia long precedes the events uh, described in his main narrative and is in fact lateral to his account. The main point of uh, this digression for Agathias was to criticize Cosmos 
is proven that Renamea of Ferula versed in Greek philosophy and literature. Though secondary, of secondary interest for Agathias himself, this evidence is of unique uh, value uh, for us, as it is a unique description of immigration of dissidents from Rome to Persia, and then of their return in outstanding diplomatic circumstances, as I will argue. There is no mention of any source that Agathias uh, used uh, for this excourse. The level of details made many scholars believe that the evidence originated from an account written by one of the philosophers himself, Damasius or Simplicius maybe, but that's uh, again indirect, uh, uh, just an argumentation. The story of this immigration is mostly considered currently by the scholars trustworthy. However, as is well known, numerous debates on its uh, content continue. Predominantly, these debates uh, have been centered about uh, around two points. The circumstances of philosophers' departure from the Roman Empire, its connection to the intensification of Justinian's persecution of pagans, prohibition of philosophical teaching in Athens, and the restrictions uh, of anti-pagan legislation. And secondly, the homecoming of the philosophers, and in particular, the place to which they returned, uh, uh, and what were their activities otherwise, uh, afterwards, whether they returned to Athens or stayed uh, in uh, Mesopotamian areas. So, uh, mostly the research is, uh, current research of previous is about that. I suggest, oops, I'm sorry, I suggest to focus on the philosophers alleged staying con in Tessiphon, and then on the circumstances of their departure from there. We don't know uh, when this immigration started exactly, and whether it uh, followed a direct invitation from the Persian side. In my opinion, and judging by other known cases of high, profi high profile immigration, it was hardly a spontaneous decision, and some involvement of the Persians is very likely. Whether from the start it was Postroes who was personally involved, it is difficult to say, though again, it seemed very likely. He started his rule uh, in 531. Justinian's uh, anti-pagan, uh, so to say, <coughs> philosophical restrictions that I believe to have triggered the departure of the philosophers were happening around the year 529. We have, however, no evidence of <coughs> how soon after these restrictions the dissident group left Athens, nor on whether their move was anyhow connected directly to Postroy's uh, accession to power. As we shall see further, the only secure date is that they left Ctesiphon sometime after the summer of 532. The seven moved to Persia with an intention to stay there permanently, says Agathias, thus justifying the use uh, of the word emigration. The group was well received in Ctesiphon, though the city is not mentioned uh, in the account directly in Agathias' text. It can be presumed from the description of a direct interaction uh, with the Shah, as well as from uh, what we know about the cosmopolitan intellectual environment in the 6th century Tessifon. However, apparently soon after their arrival, the philosophers became disappointed with the Persian way of life and with the king himself. And Agathias concludes quite br briefly that for all those reasons the philosophers returned home as soon as possible. Speaking about the reasons of philosophers' immigration, as I have already said, Agathias mentions two factors, or rather there are two layers uh, in his descriptions. An idealized image of Persia as a pull factor and persecutions at home as a push factor. So, if the disappointment, alleged disappointment, has triggered the return, that what about the initial problem of persecutions that pushed them uh, away from the empire? Agathias remarks that the philosophers benefited, I quote, from their stay abroad in an important and conspicuous way, such uh, that their life from their own ended in the most pleasant and agreeable manner. The group must have been present at the Persian court when a so-called uh, uh, endless peace treaty or eternal peace treaty was being negotiated and signed between Rome and Persia in 532. According to our text, in Agathias again, uh, upon the insistence of Cosroes, a clause was inserted in the peace treaty to guarantee safety of freedom of religion, so to say, for the philosophers after their return back. 
this condition of the peace treaty seems remarkable and unique in late antique diplomacy. <coughs> it may be argued that diplomatic agreements between Rome and Persia, which included articles protecting religious groups, bear some similarity to the closing question. Indeed, there is, however, a significant difference between those agreements and the clause described by Agathias. The latter was meant to protect not a religious community in general, but only the seven individuals in question, which seems unprecedented in late antique diplomatic context. A striking feature is the apparently unilateral character of this clause. The condition envisioned an intrusion into the affairs of another state and unreciprocated, such intrusion would have created a misbalance of status between the realms. And I think that appears uh, quite unlikely in, in, in this form. Information about the conditions of the Endless Peace Treaty is scattered through several sources, with the most detailed account being given by Procopius and uh, Malalas. The treaty regulated territorial, financial, and military arrangements and concessions. It also included several articles regarding the exchange of captives and other displaced people. And it seems important to look at the protecting clause, that clause of protection, against the background of other articles in the peace treaty concerning the status of different categories of migrants. So, first was we know uh, the question of Iberian refugees. After an unsuccessful uprising against the Persian power in Iberia in the middle of 520s, the king of Iberia, Gugganus, together with the nobility, had to flee and ask asylum in Constantinople. According to the Endless Peace Treaty, as recounted by Procopius, while Iberia remained in Persian hands, these refugees were free to choose whether to stay in Constantinople or to come back home. After tense negotiations, the sides also agreed to return to each other the forts that were seized during the war. Malalas mentions that the forts were mutually returned together with the captured inhabitants, prisoners. Then we know <coughs> the sources mention two individual exchanges of prominent captives that occurred as a result of the same peace. A Roman military commander, Domitiolo Domitiolos, taken prisoner by the Persians uh, in the battle near Kalinicum in 31, was exchanged for a Persian nobleman, Yezdegar, a nephew of Hermes, the ruler of Arzanen. And another case, another exchange of captive is described by Procopius. He informs us that Dagoris, a bodyguard of one of Roman military commanders, captured in 530, was returned to the Romans as a result of the same treaty. And in exchange, the Persians received another man of no mean station, a prominent Persian. Procopius characterized the return Dagoris as an exceptionally able warrior. However, the historian never mentions the name of this prominent Persian man exchanged for him. It is remarkable that none of these sources speaking about the Endless Peace Treaty mention this clause protecting the philosophers. And their mission is particularly striking in the account by Procopius, who extensively covered the process of the negotiations and as well as the conditions of the treaty. There might, however, be a missing piece in the mosaic of sources on the endless peace treaty or <coughs> on the interrupted state of the philosophers in Ctesiphon. An anonymous uh, East Syriac account of uh, the martyrdom of Grigor could perhaps add, uh, give some additional information on clauses of protection within uh, the peace treaty. The text was written most likely in the second half of the 6th century by an author belonging to the Christian uh, milieu of the Persian Empire. The protagonist of the account, Iran Gushnas, originated from a prominent family, the house of Mikran. He held a high military appointment in the northern regions of Persia, and there, around year 518 or 21, he was converted <coughs> to Christianity, taking the name Grigor. That's what uh, the martyrdom tells us quite uh, in details. Then, during a Roman incursion into the region under his charge, most likely in uh, 528, Grigor was taken prisoner and deported to the Roman Empire. He was 
brought to the emperor, who must have been already Justinian, and the emperor, impressed by the prominence of Grigor's position in Persia, as the source claims, and especially by his Christian faith, welcomed the captive with numerous gifts and gave him an even more important position than he previously held in Persia. Though, while nothing is known about this allegedly high military appointment of Grigor in the Roman Empire, it was, however, not unusual for both states uh, to employ renegades, defectors, and also captives from the adversary side to utilize their expertise, in particular in military affairs, and there are some uh, analogies. Later, Mark Grigor was claimed back by the Persians during diplomatic negotiations. That's what the next uh, uh, part of the text uh, tells us. And uh, the emperor, says Martyrdom, was reluctant to extradite Mark Grigor. And then a remarkable detail is reported in the text. Uh, Justinian made, oh, the emperor, made the Persian ambassador promise that Grigor would not be persecuted as a Christian once he returns to the country of his fathers, once he goes back to Persia, according to the same, to this, to this diplomatic agreement. And then Boy agreed and ensured that everything necessary was done, says the text. It's very plausible that this promise was confirmed by the peace treaty. Uh, Grigor did not return to Persia, in fact, immediately together with the envoy. He was released only after the treaty was concluded, and the text mentions the establishment of an agreement, diplomatic agreement between the two states, and then Grigor's subsequent uh, travel journey to Nisibis, where he uh, only then he joined uh, the ambassador who initially claimed him. The text also makes it possible to suggest that the safeguard for Grigor was included as a clause or as a condition. Anyway, it was mentioned uh, in that treaty. Uh, despite some chronological inconsistencies in the accounts, and I omit the details about these calculations to save for, for the sake of time now, but I'm happy to, to discuss them, it seems plausible to identify the peace agreement that included a guarantee of protection for Mount Grigor as the endless peace treaty signed by Kostras and Justinian in 532. The same diplomatic agreement that, according to Agathias, granted the guarantee of protection to the seven philosophers and that included several other articles concerning exchange of the migrants. And accepting this interpretation, I suggest confronting the information provided by, on the one hand, the martyrdom of Grigor, with the data from the other sources that are traditionally used to reconstruct the conditions of the treaty. One might, might that is very conjectural, of course, suggest that the prominent Persian, for example, exchanged uh, uh, according to Procopius, uh, with the naval uh, warrior Dagoris, mm -hmm. that could have been Pirangus Nasman Grigor, though it's very conjectural. And then confronting the text of the Syriac martyrdom with Agathias' evidence, it appears tenable to presume that not one, but two symmetrical protection clauses were integrated in the peace treaty. One for the Hellenic philosophers coming back to the Roman Empire from Persia, and one for the Christian Persian general returning to Persia from Constantinople. Furthermore, I believe that it cannot be excluded that the demands for extradition stimulated both returns, not only the repatriation of Grigor. So it probably was not that much the disappointment uh, claimed uh, by Agathias, the disappointment, immediate disappointment in the Persian way of life that triggered the fact the second immigration, if you will, but that was, it was not such a voluntary act, uh, uh, in fact. In international relations, a state of alliance meant that partners were expected and obliged to not receive fugitives of any kind and to extradite those whom they previously had accepted. Requests for extradition of runways frequently accompanied diplomatic negotiations throughout the, 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 the civil. The existence of two symmetrical requirements and liabilities would furthermore provide, have provided the necessary balance 
and diplomatic reciprocity in relations uh, between the two sovereigns. And I would like to add another, uh, just briefly, another interesting example of a forced extradition, also of a dissident refugee, happening as a consequence of the same peace treaty, so in the same, <coughs> roughly in the same time span, the story of John of Teller. This story, however, demonstrates a different level of uh, Roman-Persian interstate uh, interaction, not primary, away from the royal courts, but happening on a lower level. But the episode in itself is extremely revealing. We are well informed about uh, John of Teller's biography, thanks to two Syriac lives written by John of Ephesus and Elias, and the latter contains, contains particularly detailed accounts of the events of John's life, descriptions of places and movements that is, uh, and uh, that material uh, related by Elias is believed to be based uh, on his autopsy and on his uh, personal knowledge uh, of uh, John of Teller, the Holy uh, John of Teller was among the many non-Calcedonian bishops in Mesopotamia who refused to adhere to Chalcedonian creed. With other monks, he eventually deserted to the area of Mardin, performing while in exile numerous ordinations and conversions for the disrupted non calcedonian communities on both sides of the Roman-Persian border, and that is a very important evidence. In fact, by 530s, the non calcedonian bishops and a major figure among them, John of Teller, had established a powerful community, or rather a well-connected network of priests that was threatening, in a sense, the imperial Chalcedonian authority and probably also disturbing the Persian church on the east because it was operating on both sides, uh, transcending uh, the political border between, between the states. The new wave of persecution started in 536-37 when Ephraim of Amida, the Chalcedonian patriarch of Antioch, made his violent descent to the east to hunt the Roman <coughs> At this moment, John of Teller was on the Persian territory, on the Mount Sinjar, not far from the border. Having somehow obtained information about John's location, the Patriarch entered into contact with the Persian military official of the border region, Marzaban Mikhudad. Ephraim asked the Marzaban to dispatch Persian soldiers so that a joint Roman-Persian forces might find and apprehend John of Teller. And there are several extremely interesting details, uh, I think, worth deconstructing in this evidence. First of all, notable is uh, this Roman-Persian collaboration on the local ecclesiastical administrative uh, military level to apprehend the, the fugitive. Marzaban, with that, agreed to get involved in the operation and sent his officer with cavalry. And this joint Roman-Persian squad was accompanied by scouts from both sides who knew the territory. And, and it, the, the, the life uh, is really very detailed. We have all the details of how they traveled, what were the weather conditions, how they had to sleep in the snow, and so on and so forth. It's really a wonderful uh, text. <coughs> So they departed from Nisibis and headed to the mountain Sinjar, a 100 kilometer long massif close to the Roman Persian border. The persecutors managed to find John's location on the mountain and John and the community uh, living with him were arrested. Once brought to Nisibis, Marzaban, uh, John of Teller was interrogated by the Marzaban. They talked through an interpreter and it's an interesting detail, who uh, addressed, uh, was addressing John in Greek, not in Syria. And the dialogue, I think, is worth to be quoted. So it goes, How you dare a man such, a man such as you to cross over to our country without, without us, without our permit? Don't you know that this is another state, Politea? And John responds, uh, well, this is not the first time that I have crossed over to this land. It is rather the third time that I have passed over. 
Further, today there is so much peace between the two kingdoms that I do not make a distinction between the two states. The two kings are brothers in love. Thus, whenever I am here, I feel I am on the Roman territory. Whenever I am on the Roman territory, I feel I am here because of the same peace. This interchange, in my opinion, is of outstanding importance for understanding the functioning of the Roman-Persian border and interstate relations in this, in this moment. The region of northern Mesopotamia is often characterized as an open frontier or as a zone of transit, particularly in the periods of peace. Sources, especially her geography, indeed show considerable amount of uh, different types of mobility happening in the region, including that across the border. Traveling across the border was, however, I believe different from transiting the frontier and staying. And while a certain degree of not controlled mobility on the frontier could have been tolerated by the authorities of both states and was often tolerated, as, as we well know for, from the text, the Moors were likely supposed to have a, a permit, some permission to stay on a foreign territory. And the absence of such a permit from the Persians is exactly the Marzabans' reproach to John. Apart from the problem of staying, from the receiving country perspective, there also existed the problem of leaving the home country. In the same dispute with John, Marzaban in fact accused the saint of rebelling against the Roman authorities. That's also an interesting accusation from the Persian side. And this accusation was also made uh, by the Persian officer who arrested John on the mountains in Jar. And it probably, the accusation must have featured in the commission for John's uh, arrest. And John both times denies uh, the accusation claiming that his full loyalty to the emperor. In the winter of 536-37, when the arrest of John was happening, Rome and Persia were indeed in the state of peace, as we will remember after the endless or eternal peace treaty was concluded uh, in, in 532. In his dialogue with the Marzabon, John of Teller refers to that state of peace to justify his presence on the Persian territory. From international point of view, however, the conditions of peace, the condition of peace did not mean that borders were becoming a <coughs> for free circulation. Rather, the opposite is true. Again, from the state and international uh, point of view. As uh, said already, conclusion of a diplomatic alliance normally required that sides stop accepting and release previously accepted fugitives, deserters, runaways, and exchange the captives. Another Roman Persian uh, peace treaty concluded 30 years later contained a special clause that those who, I quote, in time of peace defect and desert from one side to another shall not be received, but every means shall be used to return them, even against their will, to those from whom they fled. So that's how this uh, type of mobility uh, was framed in, in, in diplomatic uh, context. Thus, the chasing operation and the following delivery uh, of John of Teller to a friend, to the Roman authorities, was in fact an act of extradition. Indifferent to other cases, notably to that of the philosophers of, of MacGregor, who were hosted uh, in Ctesiphon and in Constantinople and returned from there, extradition of John of Teller was performed uh, locally, not on the state, but uh, uh, on, on, on somewhat lower local level. To conclude, the philosophers found their asylum at the court of Kosferis, and it was probably not the disappointment with the Persian way of life that caused their departure from Tessifon. From the Persian perspective, their stat uh, from the Roman sorry, perspective, their status was probably that of fugitive. Oh, from, the broad, from the Persian perspective, they were giving them asylum as to fugitives. So conclusion of the Roman peace treaty with Constantinople was very likely to oblige Khosrow to send his refugees back home. And it seems not unreasonable to suppose that as Grigor's uh, release from Constantinople was initiated by the Persian demand for his extradition, a similar and symmetrical request from Constantinople might have preceded the philosopher's famous return to the empire. In the case of John of Tello, we see uh, how after the conclusion of the same peace treaty, several years after, but when the peace is still 
on and, and, and uh, functioning, the authorities of the two states cooperated to apprehend another dissident escaping Justinian's power. Travelers and migrants, in particularly members of military, political, intellectual elites of Rome and Persia, <coughs> often crossing the border between the two states. Ctesiphon and Constantinople provided cosmopolitan environments while the state authorities uh, of both states were often interested for various political, military and cultural reasons to support and sponsor such immigration. However, these individual high-profile movers were also easily identifiable. Norms of diplomacy and circumstances of international politics could challenge the political hospitality of the hosts, exposing migrants to demands of extradition and forced repatriation. The conditions of the Endless Peace Treaty and of many other diplomatic agreements regulated the status of both forced and voluntary migrants. Thus, the structural regulations minimize the role of personal agency of the movers, in particular the high-profile ones. One of the seven philosophers who traveled to Persia, Simplicius of Cilicia, in his commentary upon the Manual of Epictetus, discusses the appropriate behavior of philosophers in a corrupt, or worthless state. And from the notion of abstinence from public affairs that ascends to passage in Plato's Republic, Simplicius moves to the cosmopolitan thesis that one will emigrate to another better state if he can. Just as Simplicius and his fellow refugees tried to do themselves. However, the sustainability of such cosmopolitan choices largely dependent on the fluctuations of interstate politics. Thank you very much for your time. So our ne next speaker is Henry De. He is assistant professor of ancient history at the University of Constance, Germany. He studied Eastern literature at Kiel University in 2006. He completed his doctoral thesis about the depiction of the Sassanian in the works of Procopius of Caesarea, supervised by Josef de Seduca, and publishing it in 2007 as Procopium de Perse. Since then, he has published several articles on the Sassanian mon monarchy and on the relation between Iran and the Roman Empire. In 2013, he published a textbook about the history of the Western Roman Empire, and in 2017, he completed his habilitation thesis, a study on civil war in Hellenistic Greece. In 2017, <coughs> he was a visiting professor at Humboldt University in, uh, in Berlin, and in 2018, at the University of Tübingen. His paper today is titled A Power Struggle in Tessifon 309 CE, Shaput II and the Paradox of Child Emperor Rule in Sassanian Iran. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, very happy to be at this yeah. exciting uh, conference, and I hope you won't be too disappointed. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So uh, in 309 CE, the Sasanian royal court in Tisiphon witnessed some truly amazing events that must have caused a stir inside as well as outside the empire. Looking back from the 6th century, the Greek historian Agathius describes them with the following words, Shapur enjoyed an exceedingly long reign, the length of which coincided exactly with the length of his life, for he was still in his mother's womb when the future offspring was called to the throne. Since it was uncertain whether the queen would give birth to a son or a daughter, the leading men offered prizes and gifts to the Magoi if they foretell the future. When the Magoi said that a male child would be born, they no longer delayed, but putting the crown on the mother's womb, they proclaimed as king the fetus, conferring upon it the distinction of a name and a royal title, when, I suppose, it had only just 
reach that stage of development at which it is capable of making a few slight throbbing movements inside the womb. Soon after, in fact, Shapur was born, possessed of the royal title at birth. He grew up on the throne and he grew old on it, living to the right old age of 70. As is well known, Agathius claims to have used a Persian source for his account of Sasanian history, a work he calls Royal Annals, translated into Greek by a certain Servius. And indeed, later Persian and Arab authors, such as Hamza Isfahani, also report that Shapur II was crowned in utero by placing the diadem on the belly of his mother, Ephra. And we are told that he was acclaimed as king of kings by the nobility and the priests. Tabari relates how a number of courtiers and priests led the government for the infant king, who of course is said to have impressed all of them very early on with <coughs> tremendous intelligence. For example, the clever boy allegedly initiated the construction of a new bridge over the Tigris, which greatly facilitated traffic uh, within the city, or the cities. All in all, the sources, none of them contemporary, of course, give the impression that Shapur's minority did not pose a major problem for the Sasanian monarchy. Only in the extreme west of the empire, in Mesopotamia and in Fas, the ancestral lands of the Sasanian dynasty, Arabs are said to have seized the opportunity, plundering the countryside in 325 of the 16 years, when Shapio was 16 years old and an adult, and thus yet finally come of age, according to Tabari, he gathered a small elite force of warriors with whom he is said to have personally attacked the Arab tribes that had spread in southern Mesopotamia. After first successes, the king apparently crossed the Persian Gulf and attacked the enemies in their own homeland, with the Sasanian soldiers priests proceeding with extreme cruelty that was never to be forgotten. After this victorious campaign, Shapur returned to his kingdom and took over the government himself. Reading the Roman, Arabic, and Persian sources, we thus get the impression of an astounding success. An infant is ascending to the throne with a group of aristocrats conducting business for 16 years without threatening the stability of the Sasanian Empire. If we believe the sources, there was no attempt to replace Shapur with an adult. This is all the more astonishing as the infant's accession to the throne was in fact preceded by turmoil. Shapur had at least seven brothers, and when his father, whom is the second, suddenly died, <coughs> easy from witnessed a dangerous power struggle. Shapur's oldest brother, Adon Nasi, was killed after having sat on the throne for a short while, a fact that is omitted by many sources, including Agathius. Another prince was blinded and mutilated, and at least one other had to flee to the Romans. Moreover, the Sasanian Empire had not yet fully recovered from the heavy defeat the Sasanians had suffered ten years earlier at the hands of the Roman Caesar, Galerius. In that one word, when Sharpo came to the throne, the political situation was actually everything other than stable. With this in mind, the question arises of how to explain that Sharpo not only survived his childhood, but grew up to be one of the most famous of all Sasanian kings. Actually, only two explanations are conceivable. Either one group had prevailed so completely in the power struggle after the death of Hormitz II that for years no resistance stirred once Shapur had been installed on the throne as a puppet. Or Shapur's kingship was the result of a compromise accepted by all the major players in the empire, the powerful magnates of the Iranian plateau, the members of the royal court at Tisiphon, not, not that kind of, obviously, the Zoroastrian clergy and the other male members of the Sasanian dynasty. As I'm about to explain, the second reading is much more likely. At this point, however, a few words about royal succession in Lenitic Iran and the character of the Sasanian monarchy are in order to be able to understand the events I have just described. The royal succession followed basically very simple rules. Apart from two exceptions, 
in the chaotic final phase of the empire, only men could ascend to the throne, <coughs> and they had to be members of the ruling family. No candidate was allowed to have visible physical defects, for example, the missing eye. And third, the acclamation by the leading magnates and high priests was required. In 293, Shapu's grandfather, Narse, had removed his own grandnephew from the throne after a brief civil war. From then on, it was clear that the king did not have to be a son of the last ruler. Instead, every direct descendant of the first Assyrian king, Ardashir, was considered as dynastically legitimized. Incidentally, there were always enough male princes available. This was ensured by the polygamy common in the high nobility. Moreover, the ways this Senyan ruler was able to regulate his own succession were limited. If he designated a prince as his successor, as Bahram II perhaps did, the nobility could override this decision after his passing. And unlike in the Roman Empire, the elevation of a prince to the status of co-ruler during the lifetime of the current king seems to have been impossible at least after Shapur I. For this reason, the death of every Sasanian king was followed by an interregnum. And this could very easily lead to a dangerous succession crisis, and this is exactly what happened in 309. In my opinion, the main reason for this was that the legitimacy of the Sasanian monarchy was marked by a mixture of dynastic and meritocratic elements. In principle, the same rules apply to the king as to the magnates. Certain families had a hereditary right to certain offices. The presidents of certain houses, the most prominent being Sasanians themselves, was dynastically legitimized. Of course, the royal house tried to rise above the other families, among other things, by claiming to be of divine origin or to have an especially close relation to the gods like Omaz, Anahi, or Mir. But in the eyes of the high nobility, the Sasanian king, in spite of everything, is very likely to have been seen as primus inter pares. And since there was no primogeniture, every Sasanian who wished to sit on the throne had to be able to prove his worth. If we ask ourselves what the powerful aristocrats expected from the king in return for their loyalty, then the most important answer is undoubtedly peace, internal peace. In this respect, the Sasanian Empire was not too different from the Roman Empire. To the Pax Augusta corresponded to the Pax Sassanica. In the long run, a king who could not preserve the internal peace and inner cohesion of the empire lost his legitimacy. By the way, I suspect this was also one of the reasons why most Sasanian kings usually avoided empire-wide persecutions of Christians and other groups. The main task of an Iranian or Roman monarch was the preservation of inner peace and persecutions disturb this peace. Organized attacks on certain groups were therefore usually um, ordered only if the persecuted themselves were considered to be troublemakers. Anyway, just as imperial rule over Rome could never quite shake off the civil war, a product of which it had been, so did this sort of Damocles hang over the Sasanian kings, whose power had its roots in the revolt of Ardashir against the legitimate Arsacid king Atabanus in 224. Atabanus had been vulnerable because he was involved in a long civil war with one of his brothers. The Sasanians had sided with other dissatisfied aristocrats and pushed the Arsacids off the throne in a brief but bloody conflict. Paradoxically, the very aristocracy that expected the king to enforce the Pax Assassinica was also responsible for the fact that this peace was often threatened. Like most aristocracy, the nobility of the Sasanian Empire was characterized by rivalry and competition. The fact that the claim of the royal family to the throne nevertheless was generally accepted, even in times of crisis, had several reasons. On the one hand, the high nobility had no interest in casting doubt on the dynastic principle since this would have weakened its own position. And on the other hand, the monarchy's attachment to only one family made it easier to pacify the nobility. However, if a weak ruler sat on the throne of Iran, this could easily lead to a situation familiar from the later Roman Empire, 
powerful aristocrats rivalry for the control of the weak monarch. This point is of crucial importance, for as far as I can see, neither Roman nor Eastern sources mention a strong man, a grey eminence, if you will, at the court of Shapur II and Tisiphon. This comes as a surprise, especially when we take a look at the later Roman Empire. The young Emperor Valentinian II was dominated by Arbogus, the young Arcadius by Rufinus, and little Honorius by the famous Stilicho. Moreover, these phenomena were in principle by no means unknown. In the Sasanian Empire, too, Bahram III came to the throne as a teenager in 293, and during his brief reign, he was allegedly controlled by a nobleman named Bahna. Chusro II was dominated by two uncles at the beginning of his reign. When he finally tried to get rid of them, this resulted in a long civil war. And Kavad I, who came to the throne at the age of 15 or so, could only free himself from the dominance of Sukra from the house of Karin by having him dragged from the throne room by another nobleman. When the man in question actually usurped power is of minor importance, what matters is that the existence of a young ruler who was not expected to be the master of his own fate usually created a power vacuum that certain people tried to fill. The Sasanian kings, I just cited as examples where, as far as we can see, all teenagers who, although young and inexperienced, were technically adults. Their weakness came mainly from the fact that they did not have sufficient authority due to a lack of own achievements. They all had to either forcibly emancipate themselves from their environment or they failed because they were challenged by a usurper. This had been the way in which Shapur's grandfather, Narsay, had assumed power, fighting a civil war against his nephew, Bahram III, as I've already mentioned. Whenever small children ascended to the Roman throne, it was because there was no one else who had a comparable dynastic legitimacy. Without exception, all child emperors in Rome were natural sons of an emperor. And that meant that according to the unwritten rules of the Roman monarchy, they either became emperors or they had to die. In the Sasanian Empire, the situation was fundamentally different. Similar to today's Saudi Arabia, there existed always a number of eligible princes who could ascend to the throne. And at the same time, one did not have to kill a male Sasanian to exclude him, at least not under normal circumstances. Chapel II was not crowned because the royal family would otherwise be extinct. In fact, there would have been enough suitable candidates. After the elimination of Homid's eldest three sons, Shapur's older brother Ardashir had to wait 70 years before he could ascend the throne himself, because in 309, the Wuzur Khan deliberately chose the youngest and most helpless prince to become king. Mm -hmm. That the nobility and priest chose a toddler, this is wrong, uh, chose a toddler to become king must therefore have been the result of a conscious decision. And the fact that apparently all major players in the empire were ready to accept the solution rather than doubting the legitimacy of the regime, violently resisting it, speaks against the notion that Shapur was considered to be a puppet of a particular faction. In my view, the fact that little Shapur, unlike his older brothers, was not killed or challenged by a rival can only be explained by the fact that the coalition behind the child was so broad and so powerful that a revolt seemed hopeless. So, if a Sasanian king was expected to be able to act on his own, how then can we explain the fact that Shapur II not only came to the throne as an infant, and was not replaced by an adult Sasanian, but that the existing sources also know nothing of a guardian, a regent, a great eminence, and do not report that there was a fight for the control of the small child. In my opinion, Pax the Sinitica played an important role in this. Most of the Wuzurgan who had positions at the royal court in Tizifun in 309 or ruled vast territories in the Iranian plateau must still have had fresh memories of the civil wars that had shaken the empire in the years before 293. Moreover, internal conflicts usually had further consequences. For example, the civil war between Bahram II and one of his brothers had enabled the Roman emperor Carus to conquer and plunder Ctesiphon in 283. Therefore, 
The sudden death of Hans II and the subsequent power struggles between different princes must have worried the leading men of the Sasanian Empire greatly. A civil war seemed imminent, and in this critical situation, there must have been powerful men looking for a way out. Perhaps the influential Zoroastrian high priest, the Mubadan Mubad Adurbad, acted as a mediator, but we don't know. We mustn't forget that the royal court in Tiziphon was truly the heart of the Iranian Empire. It was a place of fierce aristocratic competition where those who aspired for power and prestige struggled for offices, honors, and influence. Therefore, in order to avoid a civil war, one had to find a compromise that would produce neither winners nor losers among the nobility. This was, of course, an almost impossible task. Although the sources remained silent, it is not too daring to assume that parties at court had already formed around several Sassanian princes, three of which had soon been eliminated. This was probably the reason why the situation was so dangerous. Whoever enforced his candidate could hope from then on to stand in the special favor of the king, increasing the influence of his own family. However, for that very reason, choosing a certain prince was automatically a challenge to the supporters of all the others. In this dangerous situation, the existence of Shapur, either actually still unborn or much more probably only a few weeks old, offered a way out. If the small child could be placed under the tutelage of a body in which all the relevant family families were represented, the succession of the royal to the royal throne could be resolved without producing losers and without provoking a civil war. Precisely because Shapur was a blank slave, he could help preserve the peace. In other words, what the Sasanian Empire needed in 309 to avoid a new civil war was paradoxically an infant on the throne. As I said before, this hypothesis cannot be proven conclusively, but in my opinion it is more or less the only explanation that can be reconciled with what our sources report. Someone must have made sure that no major player felt disadvantaged by the new regime. Unfortunately, we do not know who was responsible for this diplomatic masterpiece. It seems probable that the body leading the government in Tiziphone in the years following 309 followed a policy that was in accordance with the wishes of the most powerful noble families. Indeed, there are indication that, uh, indications that during these years, Sasanian foreign policy concentrated on the eastern parts of the empire, which for most of the magnates always took precedence over the Roman border. Already by 311, the reconquest of the important provinces of Turan and Hindustan, which had been lost in the previous years, was apparently achieved, while at the same time, apparently nothing was done to prevent the Arabs from plundering Mesopotamia and Fars. In these areas, the heartland of the Sasanian family, the Iranian nobility had limited interest. There was peace with the Romans, because civil war raged in the Roman Empire until 324, and it took Constantine 13 more years to decide it was finally time to increase his prestige by attacking the Sasanians. So peace in the West, victories in the East, and the satisfaction of the most important noble families came together to support the regime and preserve the peace. It is hardly a coincidence that Shapur, when he finally came of age, immediately started a war against the Arabs. One can regard this not only as a symbol of his emancipation, but also as an attempt to secure the areas that formed the economic basis of royal power. Interestingly enough, Shapur apparently didn't find it necessary to violently rid himself of certain people in order to free himself. This is probably an indication that such a grey eminence simply did not exist. It is noteworthy, however, that probably at this time, Hormitz, one of Shapur's elder brothers, had to flee to the Romans. He was later to accompany the Emperor Julian on his fateful Persian campaign. The background of these events is as unclear as the exact time of the prince's flight. However, the fact that Hormitz is mentioned only by Roman authors, such as Amianus and Zosimus, may be an indication that the conditions at the Sasanian court under Shapur II were not quite as harmonious as the sources was have us believe. But certainty is impossible to achieve. By the way, I don't know any coins that depict Shapur as a child. 
he seems to have been portrayed as a bearded adult right from the beginning of his reign. Overall, Shatu's early reign remains a singular exception in 800 years of Azazid and Sasanian history. This can hardly be stressed enough. Unlike in the Hellenistic or the late Roman monarchies, there was usually no place for a child ruler in Tisiphon. Not only did putting a child on the throne contradict Iranian ruler ideology, but more importantly, there was usually simply no need to make a child king, because every male member of the Sasanian clan could be a legitimate ruler, and there were always enough princes available. And thirdly, a Sasanian king couldn't make his little son co-ruler during his own lifetime, as did Theodosius I with Honorius, or Theodosius, uh, or Cadius with Theodosius II. For this reason, with the single exception of Shapo II, all Sasanian rulers were at least teenagers at the time of their um, coronation. It's time for a short summary. Although the extant sources unfortunately only allow speculations as to the cause of Shapu's accession to the throne and his survival, I hope I have been able to show that the same factors responsible for his coronation are also crucial to explain the fact that the small child on the throne was not challenged by an adult rival. Apparently, the key men of the Sasanian Empire in 309 had no interest in a new civil war. That would have been almost inevitable if a prince had been made king behind whom followers had already gathered. Replacing the Sasanian dynasty altogether wouldn't have resulted in violence as well. In this moment of crisis, somebody, perhaps a representative of the Zoroastrian clergy, must have resorted to the ingenious solution of settling on the only prince who was still a completely slave. We may assume that royal women also may have played a part in this, but we do not know much more about Shapo's mother than her name. Much remains unclear, so much so that the suspicion arises that the existing sources distort events and conceal problems. We do not even know how exactly the Sasanian Empire was governed between 309 and 325. It seems plausible, however, that there was no particular family or group controlling the king, but that all important groups in the empires were treated in a way that was acceptable to them. The Pax Sassanidica remained protected since the magnets were apparently in Ctesiphon as long as one could possibly give the impression that no one else had monopolized control of the Shah and Shah. In a word, whoever stood behind the measures carried out in 309 accomplished a masterpiece in statesmanship. And Ctesiphon, the heart of the empire and the meeting place of the Iranian elite, was the only place where such a compromise could be made. Despite its success, the solution of 309 remained a unique occurrence, owing its, its, owing its existence to a singular constellation. In later crises, the special interests within the Iranian nobility seem to have prevailed. For example, the year-long wars of succession plaguing the Sasanian Empire after the death of Shusro II played a decisive role in the events leading to the downfall of the dynasty. All in all, the same child emperor Shapur II remained the exception that proved the rule. Thank you very much for your patience.